Hello everybody. Um, so the next talk, the title is Vulnerability Intelligence for All, Say Goodbye to Data Keeping. Without further ado, please welcome our speaker, Jerry Gamblin. Over to you. Thank you, thank you. No need to clap. Let's see. All right, like she said, we're gonna talk about vulnerability intelligence for all. Let's say goodbye to data keeping, uh, data gatekeeping. So a quick agenda here, we're just gonna do a quick introduction. Uh, we're then gonna run through the need for vulnerability intelligence. I'm gonna talk about some of the best open source vulnerability intelligence. And then we're gonna go to some consolidating vulnerability intelligence. I only have 20 minutes, but the good thing is, right when you get out of here, you're gonna go get lunch. So nobody's gonna get mad if I finish a little bit early today. So just to be basically clear here, all organizations have a need for vulnerability intelligence. Very few organizations have a need for threat intelligence. Everybody you go to will say, oh, you gotta buy a threat intelligence feed. You're a small organization, a couple hundred people, please spend $80,000 on a threat intelligence feed. Most organizations don't need that. Let's break that down. What's the difference between a threat intelligence feed and a vulnerability intelligence feed? Threat intelligence feed gives you all the five whys, right? The who, what, when, where, why, and how. Most organizations don't need to care about the who and the why. And that's what you're paying for with a threat intel feed. If, if, you're, working, if you're a college, a mid-sized college in the Midwest, a bank in the Midwest, something that's not getting attacked every day by an APT, do you really care who or why somebody is deploying a, a CVE scan? Are you, know, are you gonna be able to do anything about it if you know that this is who? So the answer to that to most people is no. And when you get to the point to understand, I don't need a threat intel feed, I don't need to read about you know, what the latest hackers from the Russian Federation are doing or North Korea or China or whoever the boogeyman is this year, and I just need to work on protecting my network, you can really save your organization a bunch of money. But let's get in and talk about the need for vulnerability intelligence because this is even a bigger deal. I spent the last basically 15 years of my career working on vulnerability, vulnerability management for companies. And I work with a great company called Scientia. And we know that no matter what size your company is, from 500 people to a Fortune 500 company, you can patch about 10% of the vulnerabilities on your network a month. So you're always, you're always behind, you're always not able to catch up. So what we want to do is help people pick the right 10%. Um, I'll put these slides up on, on GitHub at the end and you can grab them because they all have the links. The other thing is, is that the CVE growth is looking like this. Uh, one of my many side projects is CVE.ICU. If you ever just want to see how many CVEs there are, you can go check that out. But as of this morning, there are 209,169 CVEs. That's 24 CVEs a day since 1999 when the CVE list was created. That seems like a lot, but if you just look at this year, we're at 80 CVEs, unique CVEs per day. When I first started way back there, when there were about 20 CVEs a day, I could sit at my desk and go through bug track and figure out which ones I need to look at and which ones are important to me. I can't do that anymore. And very few companies have the staffing to be able to say, hey, monitor all the CVEs, figure out which ones are important to me and which ones we need to patch. So the truth of the matter is, at the end of the day, less than 7% of CVEs ever become exploited. So we know that, that as grows, this number is shrinking, but every day people put out CVEs that are only exploitable, you know, in proof of concept, and that's about 20% of them. And then about 60% of all CVEs are just academic CVEs is what we call them. You have the vulnerabilities there, the code is vulnerable, but they weren't able to produce an exploit to even put on the CVE. They said, hey, we're, we're filing this, we think this could happen, you know, in, in, the right, in the right circumstances, you could patch that. 
So here's what everybody needs to think about when you start building out your CVE vulnerability intelligence program. I like to build this out. It's just a little chart. It's the, the CVE in the middle, and you go how, what, when, and where around the side. And you need that for every CVE that's on your network that you expect to be exploited. Uh, here is one that I did for CVE 2023. It was one of the Google Chrome ones. It just obviously says what's being impacted, Google Chrome. It's been exploited in the wild since the middle of April. It's a network-based vulnerability, so I need to, to get on it. And it's a type confusion, right? So you get all that information, and that's when you know you need to act. If you build those for all the CVEs you have, then you can start prioritizing what on your network needs to be patched first. We're going to jump right into open source vulnerability intelligence. Uh, this is where you can go and get some of the best open source data on the internet, and it's free, and every organization should be using it. And I will tell a little dark secret here. If you're not using this open source data and you're paying somebody to be a threat intel feed, they're taking this open source data and feeding it to you and charging you money for it, right? Most of the times it's like, here's 90% open source stuff, we'll throw 10 or 15% of our, our own proprietary data in there, but, but this is where everybody's getting the data. So first we'll start with the high quality data. Uh, CISA, known exploited vulnerabilities catalog. If you work in the federal government, you know about this one. Uh, as of this morning, it contains 983 CVEs. Um, the binding operational directive was 2201, if you're interested in, in reading what they actually have to do. The, the guts of this is that when a CVE is added to this list, the federal government has six months from the date it's added to get it remediated off their network. That's a long leash for them, and there are very few CVEs on there. Um, what I like to tell people to do is that this is a good starting point. If you don't have a vulnerability intelligence program, let's start with the KEV list and make sure that you have all of those removed from your network first, and then we can build out a more substantial list. The next one here is, gonna, is going to surprise people a little bit. It's Metasploit. Um, it contains over 2,000 CVEs. People ask, why do you look at Metasploit? And I say, Metasploit is the best pen testing framework. It has close to 1,500 known exploits that, that you're paying your pen testers to use against you. You know the code is valid. So we're going to take those CVEs that we know that are in Metasploit, and we're going to make sure you have those patched, right? We're using the Red Team's toolkit against themselves before someone's able to charge you $10,000 to tell you to, to patch the stuff in Metasploit, right? So you might as well just cut out the middleman and get right to Metasploit and patch those. Um, so the next one here is a, something that I'm very familiar with and very passionate about. It's called EPSS. It's the Exploit Prediction Scoring System. It's through first.org, which also runs CVSS for. Um, what it does is it measures the likelihood of every CVE being exploited in the next 30 days. Um, it's industry supported and backed. And if anybody in here is super interested in vulnerability intelligence, we have a special interest group that meets uh, twice a month. The email at the bottom, we'd love to have more people. Uh, we have an open Slack too. We, we love to have people join and to be part of this discussion. The people who give their data freely to, to EPSS are Cisco, Shadow Server, Gray Noise, F5, Alien Vault, and Fortinet. So if you know those companies and you talk to them, please say thank you for providing this data to, to the EPSS project to help make the internet secure. So let's talk about the OK quality vulnerability intelligence sources. These are ones that you need to look at and, and kind of understand, have a little bit deeper of knowledge of what's going on before you add them to your patch list. So on the left here is ExploitDB. How many of you guys were alive in the, and working in this industry in the age of ExploitDB is where you went to get, to get code, right? Like, like that was me. Um, but then about, you know, in 2020, 2019, they kind of fell off a cliff and people stopped putting their code on ExploitDB 
and they started putting their code on GitHub. What, so, we, so we just changed where we go to look for, for POC code. And just for a baseline, I put the Metasploit in there because I love talking about Metasploit because you know that that's a solid baseline. And if there's, a, if there's an exploit, it's going to end up in Metasploit at some point if it's network-based. So GitHub is super high volume. It's lower quality, though. And if anybody here is interested in building an LLM project, I would, I would ask you to look at doing this, is look at scraping GitHub for POCs and running it through an LLM to tell you what that POC does. Uh, because a lot of times in GitHub, you'll have something that's labeled a POC, and it's really just a script that's just checking to see if it's vulnerable, right? Like it's just pulling, it's just pulling a banner and saying, yeah, you're, you're running Apache 2.43, you know, you're vulnerable. And that's not, that's not the exploits we're looking for. That's just something to tell you. And if there are 50 repos with that in there, most people don't have the time to go through and pick that out. So, so that's something that, that we're working on. I know, a bunch, I know some companies are looking at that, but if you're super interested in large language models, GitHub is a great place to scrape and, and to feed that data. Um, exploit DB is lower quality, older CVEs, it's still data still there. Um, if you're just looking for older CVEs, that's kind of the place to go. Twitter was great. Um, it had cvetrends.org, which I loved. That was an amazing project, chatter and real-time vulnerability intel. Everybody knows what, what had happened there, right? That, that's no longer there, and we're no longer able to, to use that data. So um, we're, we're looking for more real-time intelligence, too. So let's talk about consolidating vulnerability intelligence. The goal of consolidating vulnerability intelligence and CVE data is pretty simple. If you look at the big circle, that's all the published CVEs. That's what every security team thinks that they need to patch every day. The true thing they need to patch is that 7% circle that sits in the middle. If you, have, if you wanna have perfect accuracy and not waste cycles on your security team, you need to be patching the stuff that's actually exploitable. And after you get all the stuff that's actually exploitable, then you can move out to the probable, right? But we want people working on the stuff that's actually exploitable first and then move to the probable. So Monday I flew out here and I have ADHD if it's not completely obvious. So the rest of this talk was supposed to be about how to consolidate this data and build a patch list for you guys to to run and to, to use on your network. Um, I couldn't do that, so I actually just built it for everybody. Um, <laughs> so I launched patchthis.app. This is actually the first time I'm talking about it publicly. It's a combined list of CISA, Metasploit, and first.org that runs on a GitHub action, and it's updated every hour, and it pushes to a CSV for companies of any size to grab that data and to check it against what's in their vulnerability management uh, tools to make sure that they're patching everything that we know is vulnerable or is super likely to become vulnerable in the next 30 days. Um, if you look at the, the website, it completely looks like I built it on a plane in VS Code because I built it on a plane in VS Code. So, it has nothing, I am going to, to get somebody who actually knows how to build web page to, to build it, but it's out there. I would really, really like if you would share that, if you would push it out on your networks. We're trying to, to get more people to add to it. Right now, I've just added data that I know is super high quality. We're gonna go back and start tweaking a little bit and adding some more data. Because at the end of the day, I want everybody to be secure, and not everybody has threat intelligence money, but everybody should be able to have vulnerability intelligence feeds that are curated and put together this way so that they can go and, and help protect their school districts, their libraries, even, even their for-profit organizations. Um, with that, I will take some questions and then we can go eat lunch. So, so thank you very much for, for taking time today.
Sorry, sorry. Thank you for the presentation. Appreciate it. And so I was wondering about the Kev catalog, and do you put any priority on that, the known exploited um, vulnerabilities catalog from CISA? Do you do you look at it, let's let's say first, or like like you were saying, a little percentage to where exploited, known exploited vulnerabilities? Do you use that catalog? Yeah, yeah. CISA Kev is part of is part of the the new combined list on PatchThis.app. I like CISA Kev. I, I will say that that if you want to get in the weeds. Uh, the CISA Kev does have a few local exploits where you have to be at the keyboard or you have to be or even at ship level to make the exploit work. Um, while if you're the federal government, you might worry about somebody breaking into your network and soldering a JTAG onto your Snapdragon processors, uh, the local bank, you know, the local high school probably doesn't have to worry about a threat actor going that far. But it's a good start, right? And if you can patch it, you can patch it. So. Thank you, and also with the with the feed. Thank you, because I just found out for our PCI, we had to pass a part that we were getting a feed yep. somehow, and so we had to pass that. So nice. thank you for that. No problem. Hello, hello. Do you have plans to include uh, Canvas or Core Impact exploits? Uh, yeah, we can look at those. Um, I just want to make sure that everything we add to the list is, is, is actually exploitable, so I'm going to go through and check it. Like I said, I just built this literally on a plane over the last couple of days, so I just added the stuff I know was, was highly, was highly yeah. thing. So Core yeah, Impact yeah. is good, and, and I have to check the license too, and that's the other thing. Like some of the open source tools, they have licenses, but the licenses for their feed aren't very clear. So I do have some emails out saying, hey, is it okay if I add the CVEs that are in your library here? Because I don't want to get in trouble. I don't have lawyers fighting corporations' money. Yeah, absolutely, because Canvas and um, Core Impact has a private uh, exploits. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just want to make sure that, that everything that I share is, is truly public. Any more questions? Uh, I guess a question on if you use GitLab's like SaaS tool, that static application system. Yeah. Do you, uh, and do you think that's reliable, like a good starting point? I don't know if it grabs from CISA or anything else. Yeah, I, I'm not sure. I, I haven't messed with GitLab's. I know GitHub does the same thing. Like everybody is trying to get into this vulnerability intelligence la layer and just say, hey, here's what you need to patch. Here's what's in your repo. That's an amazingly good start. Um, the problem is, is that we know that if you can only patch 10% of the stuff on your network, you need to know which 10% of the stuff actually needs to be acted upon. It doesn't do good. It, it locks people up, really. If I go to a dev and say, hey, you have 45 libraries on your, you know, in your application that are out of date and have vulnerabilities and they need to be updated, they're going to look at me like a deer in the headlights and say, we can never do 45, so we're going to do zero instead. What, what I would prefer to do is to say, hey, dev team, there are two high priority libraries in, your, in the application. We need you to get these in the next two sprints, right? And then give them another two and another two instead of just giving them the list. And that's what a vulnerability intelligence list is supposed to be able to do for you is say, hey, if you're only going to work on one to five things, here are the things that you have to work on today that's going to remove the most risk from your environment. Um, so I guess my key takeaway from your talk is that, um, you know, the proof of exploit is the most important thing to consider and not proof of concept. Yeah, because proof of concept is, I don't know, I, I have a 14-year-old son who takes Taekwondo and he comes home every, you know, twice a year and says, hey, hold your hand just like that and let me show you something really cool. Yeah, and if I hold my hand just like that, he can flip me or, or make my shoulder hurt or whatever. And I'm like... Okay, what are you going to do when you get in a fight? Are you going to say, okay, I need you to hold your hand like that, right? Like, it just doesn't work. So, yeah, proof of concept is cool when, when you can say, hey, if I have root on this Linux machine, I can run this script and crash it. Well, okay, you already have root. So it works, but it's not an exploit. I want to see proof of exploit where somebody can go from nothing or a low privileged user and make it work because that's the biggest step 
and, and that's what gets people. Is because if you look, it's not stuff with just POCs out there that are that are being exploited. It's stuff that gets the POE. And I guess the follow-up question is also about like vulnerability scoring. Would you still prioritize proof of exploit over like CVSS? And yeah, stuff like yeah that. for sure. You have to realize that CVSS is a static score. It's ran through a calculator, and it stays the same its whole, its whole life. So it never goes back and rescored. So yeah, um, CVSS4 has an exploitability uh, base in it, but it's because of the way CVSS works, all CVEs are going to be scored as F and exploit exists. The only thing you can do with that that exploit flag is lower the score of a CVSS, which makes it little less useful. Awesome, thank you. Thank you. Uh, just want to thank you for your contribution on that. That's all, it's really awesome. Oh, no, no problem. If, and I am looking for people to help, so if you can put a GitHub issue or if you use it, just, just let me know, trying to build it out as best I can. So, so awesome. thank you guys very, very much. Um, I wanted to bring up the uh, scoring system that CISA is put up for the um, stakeholder specific vulnerability categorization. And I, I haven't dived completely into yep. it, but I think it has something to do with the criticality of assets or the workflow or whatnot. Have you considered that? Yeah. Um, this, is per this is all personal. I'm here on my personal time, so it doesn't. Any, any scoring method that makes an organization or user sit down and fill out criticality or asset performance to get a score is going to fail in 99% of, of organizations. I've been, I've been in security long enough to know that people have a hard time having a complete inventory of stuff on their network, yeah, yeah. let alone telling you what the criticality of, of a machine is versus another machine on their network, right? Yeah, I agree. I guess it's time for Same as others, thank you so much for looking into this um, and for your contribution. The question is, for exploitability, what is the recommended way of looking at it? Because as you mentioned, you know, you can determine that an unprivileged app can get root, right? But other than that, like, what uh, metrics you would look in the POC to know if it's exploitable or not? So after exploitability, I look for network connectivity, right? Like if it's a network-based exploitable, that's super high because 99% of all exploits happen on network-based. So mostly you can go and get rid of everything that's hardware-based or local-based most of the time because that's not the that's not the vector that most people are dealing with on a, on a daily basis. But yeah, we look for for proof of exploitability, which means that that you have mature enough code that you can basically run it from from no access to to access. All right. Thank you guys very Thank much. Thank you, everyone.